smashing all the rules on how women buy beauty products. The founder of the Dollar Beauty Tribe is with us today. Tamara Lur, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. We are so excited about this concept. Break it down for us. This is pretty crazy. It so is. how many beauty products have we bought and thrown in the bin over the years because Countless. they don't work, right? And then we go into the shops and they give you those silly little samples. But you can't experience beauty from that, right? To welcome, this is Elric Ong, and today I'm here with Tamara Le, and she's a serial entrepreneur and award-winning businesswoman who has launched multiple ethical startups into global success, including Gutsy and Hot Tresses. She believes in mixing business with pleasure and empowering women everywhere to make an impact for the good of the world. So welcome to the show, Tamara. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Maybe you can start sharing a, a little bit more about your entrepreneurship journey. How do you get started? And then we can just go on from there. Yeah, certainly. Well, my background's actually similar to yours. It's in uh, digital marketing. Mm -hmm. So I started my first agency when I was 19. So a long time ago, uh, almost 20 years. That's showing my age. Okay. And, um, you know, I was building other people's brands. And, you know, I really loved being my own boss and, you know, getting that business to over a million dollars and, uh, you know, being able to have the luxury of choosing clients that I believed in. But uh, it wasn't until I got into Entrepreneurs Organization, uh, which mm -hmm. is a global organization, that they said to me, um, you know, you're making all this money for other people's brands. Why don't you do it for yourself? And I said, yeah, that's great. But I actually can't think of a product idea. You know, like I don't have some big idea. And they said, well, why would you? Four out of five businesses are failing. Why don't you go and save one of them? And they gave me the introduction of a model called Sweat Equity. So I turned investor about eight years ago mm -hmm. and within two years had got to over $10 million in revenue um, and then exited and then started raising capital. And yeah, that's what I've been doing ever since. But uh, picking things that I'm passionate about, so beauty and wellness that are ethical, so clean, female founded, cruelty free, locally made, all that sort of stuff. Tell me more about Sweat Equity. How do you structure the deal? If you don't mind sharing some numbers, they'll be perfect, yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly. And I look, I've even wrote a handbook on it, on my process. I really believe in experience sharing. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've documented that out because I had a lot of people inside entrepreneurs organizations saying, how are you doing this? So mm -hmm. I'd be happy to share that for you to share with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for me personally, uh, there was a couple of things that didn't sit well with me when it came to taking equity in other people's companies, especially mm -hmm. if they're just about, they're, they're desperate, right? A lot of them were coming to me after they tried they got their business to a certain size, but they just couldn't move the, the dial. So I didn't want to take equity um, unethically. So the way that I did it was it was like a no win, no fee. So mm -hmm. my specialty is really in strategy. So I would um, do a strategy day with them, uh, you know, set what the KPIs are, what I believe the growth would be, mm -hmm. uh, what we felt with the uh, valuation of the company. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, a lot of people think their businesses are valued at more than what they actually are. So getting in an independent person to tell them what the reality is of that, that valuation. And then, you know, taking anywhere between 30 and 50% of that company, I would need to earn that in. And if I didn't meet my earn in, they would get their equity back. So that's how I would do it. So that seemed really fair and reasonable. But what was great about it was I was exchanging my genius and my time uh, not money, so to speak. I was still paying for my staff in my agency, um, but uh, it, it was a very cost-effective way to take equity. Um, and really, you need to fail quickly. If it's not working within 12 months, then, you know, giving them back their equity uh, mm -hmm. is, is a great solution. They feel like they've won. They've got all this 250 grand worth of free marketing um, mm -hmm. agency stuff. And, you know, I'm letting go of something that I think, you know, was a little bit too hard to scale or the timing wasn't right. I haven't had to do that too many times, but mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, you know, one thing that I did was um, I had a look at my digital marketing agency first. Mm -hmm. So 80% of my revenue was coming from 20% of my clients. So mm -hmm. what I did was I 
I think they thought I was having a midlife crisis. Well, you know, my first one in my my 30s. I went in and I sacked the 80% of the clients that were 20% of my revenue, which freed mm-hmm. up my agency to work on equity projects. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we would take on two projects a year and we'd work on those brands and help grow them. So that mm-hmm. that's sort of the way that we approached it. Um, and, you know, I would take the equity up front but I would sign a resignation letter selling that company back for a dollar, which would sit in an accountant's or CPA's drawer. And mm-hmm. in the event that I didn't meet my earning, then, um, you know, I, I would, they would effectively get their shares back. So, okay. yeah, so that's one model. Another model that I've done in a venture capital fund that I'm a shareholder in, uh, which is a $45 million fund is, um, is, is slicing the pie. Oh, and, have you heard of that by Mike Moyer? Yeah, I just interviewed him. Uh, he was just the previous the guy, the previous guy I interviewed. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yes. So <laughs> I followed that model as well. And he's got some great software aligned to it as well. Yeah. So you, can, you know, you can pull a salary and take a salary sacrifice. In my case, I didn't need the salary. So I did which are all time for the shares. Um, and that's another great way to do it as well. So there's lots of models out there that work really well. I particularly like his because mm-hmm. it's fair um and you know my model was was a little bit different i think things have changed for me now that i'm in ypo i don't know if you want me to talk to the opportunities that i'm doing now but it's a little bit more sophisticated as far as the investments that i'm doing now in sweat equity so mm-hmm. so um when you talk about slicing pie okay so how do you structure the deal like do you um structure it exactly the way the stru- slicing pie handbook um teaches or do you add your own twist to it and how do you do that uh, no, I always think don't reinvent the wheel. I like mm-hmm. the slicing the pie model. Uh, mm-hmm. If you're going to use that, um, definitely utilize the software. I think that works really well. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the thing is, is um, the, the one mistake or the one issue that I found with that model is it says to crystallize the equity once the business is profitable. Yeah. And yeah. that doesn't cater for what I call the pig businesses. So there are two types of businesses. There's cow businesses Mm -hmm. and there's pig businesses. And this is a very unvegan analogy. But basically Mm -hmm. how it works is um, uh, if you you invest in a cow, you get milk on the way through. So you can make revenue on that on the way through. Mm -hmm. And then you also get the opportunity to perhaps have a steak, right? Um, But if you have a pig, you need to house it, feed it, all that stuff. And you don't make money until you make pork, right? Mm-hmm. So I look at things in two types of investments, a cow and a pig. And mm-hmm. it doesn't really work for pig-based businesses. So for example, with venture capital firms, the two and 20 rule, which is basically, um, you know, 20% of funds under management, um, a percentage of that goes towards you running your venture capital fund. Mm-hmm. Most VCs aren't profitable until they've got, say, 100 million or 50 million under management. So Mm -hmm. it takes a long time before you can crystallize your equity because venture capital firms in themselves aren't generally profitable. So that's Mm -hmm. probably one way where it didn't work. And I think in those cases, if you've got a pig business, you have to crystallize your equity at a different point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Cool. So so when you say you earn 30 to 50% of the company, so let's say if the company distributes dividends, so do you get 30 to 50% of the dividends um, even before, like, even before you deliver the KPI, do you get a dividends because you own the equity in the company? Well, um, part of the agreement is that we don't pay dividends until okay. we've um, we've seen out the investment plan. So these are very early stage businesses. Mm-hmm. So they really shouldn't be paying dividends. Every mm-hmm. invest, every money, uh, I believe in fifty percent of all profits should be go go back into um, you know building that business mm-hmm. as much as possible into building that business. Um, so, you know, the dividend, we, we establish all of those things up front. At what point do we take a wage? At what point, um, you know, do we start taking dividends? At, at what point, um, you know, can we look at an exit? So, for instance, I might say, look, I'm not interested in exiting this business until it's at least, at, you know, a, a 20 mil vow for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, But then we might get to the 20 mil and that person might not have something else they want to do. You know, a lot of the time it's their baby. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, putting in things like drag along clauses. So they have to sell Mm -hmm. if I find a buyer, because at the end of the day, for me, it's about an exit as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And making sure that, you know, I get a return on that investment. But you know what, other times I've got one at the moment with my business partner and we're so in love with it uh, that we're like, 
we want to keep this. We want to pass this on to our daughters, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, it just, you know, you can still have those things in the contract. doesn't mean you need to act on them. Mm-hmm. So yeah. when you... When you say you, you okay, so do you open up the do you open a venture capital firm together with your partners, or you just invested in the venture capital firm? Um, so the venture capital is separate. So that's you know some capital that we might use to deploy and invest into businesses once mm-hmm. they're a little bit more sophisticated. Mm-hmm. Uh, but really, at the start, I you know I try to only um, you know look for other ways for financing. You really don't want to give away equity too soon. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to me, my investments initially were in smaller businesses that were turning over a couple of hundred thousand, mm-hmm. a little bit different now. I'm in YPO, so the deals are a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, basically what we, um, what we want to do is make sure that we, we use any funds that we raise for when the business is a little bit more sophisticated and we're looking at Series A. And until those sorts of things come up, um, what we focus on is things like, you know, vendor finance for POs, all mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Don't forget, we're going direct to consumer online. Mm-hmm. Our pay per click is on commission only. So we only pay for our pay per click guy when he gets us a sale and it's a percentage of the sale. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got all these great things in place to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're not taking wages. The, the agency is obviously doing the work and we're all putting in equal time and have our roles. Um, but every bit of money is going back into that business. And because it's direct to consumer, there's high profit margins in starting with online. So a lot of brands that I meet that want investment or want or are thinking they want investment, I, I say to them, it's too early. It's mm-hmm. way too early to be giving away equity for money. And what are you going to do with that money? Do you even know how to use it? Because money doesn't guarantee you growth, right? And, yeah. you know, digital marketing is a beast. It changes every day. And they're like, I'm just going to pay an expensive agency to do it. And I'm like, no, mm-hmm. because, you know, a lot of the time, if you've got $10 to spend on acquiring the customer, the person who can spend the most money acquiring the customer wins. We yeah. both know that, right? Yeah. And if you're spending nine bucks for an expensive agency to do up the creative and do all that sort of stuff, you've only got a dollar left to acquire the customer. I'm all about do it the other way around. How do we bring this in house? How do we teach them how to be digital marketing engine rooms of their own? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, utilizing um, systems and processes that work so they can spend as much money as they can on acquiring the customer. And then that direct consumer, that profit margins are huge on the second sale. If we can break even on the first, get them repeat buying on the second, which we have about a 57% repeat business rate on all our consumable beauty products. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of profit. Correct. And then that profit goes back into acquiring more customers. That's our growth strategy. Does that explain it a little bit? Yeah. I I always believe that if you try to solve a problem that is not solved by money, that's not solved by having more capital, having more capital will end up creating more problems because you end up having mm-hmm. to pay the interest and the equity and all that kind of stuff. So your general the, partner... The most scalable businesses are lean and simple. Correct. Yeah. So are you a general partner or a limited partner in your VC? Um, so limited, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you just well, invest... So I've got a venture, venture capital fund, so that's a little bit differently. I'm, I'm actually a shareholder of the venture capital fund mm-hmm. um, and I'm also an investor. So I put my money in as well okay. when I get an exit. Mm -hmm. Um, and then inside the companies that I take equity in, I am a, um, equal shareholder. Uh, So, and if I'm at 30% of shareholding, I'll ask for equal voting rights. Okay. So for the venture capitalist funds, you don't really decide where they invest their money to. Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'm still, um, you know, I help with the advisory and I invest that money, definitely. But okay. um, but I'm a minority shareholder in that. Okay. So there's obviously, I don't know if you know how venture capital works, but there's yeah. an advisory board and all that. Correct, sort of correct. Stuff, so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just about me. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay. Tell me more about the opportunities in YPO and like the opportunities that you're, that you're looking at right now. Yeah, I think uh, I think the thing with YPO, so just to give people context, I, I'm, I don't know if you've, listeners would know what YPO is so should I just explain? Oh, yeah maybe yeah give a bit of context yeah uh, I got that on Clubhouse last night someone said to me are you using this acronym YPO and none of us know what you're talking about and I'm like of course <laughs> as business people know because it's usually all on our bucket list right to be in YPO mm-hmm. so uh, YPO is Young Presidents Organization it's about 25,000 members globally um, I think the average turnover of the businesses are around 45 million 
Um, you have to earn 20 mil US before you're 40 to qualify. I mm -hmm. think they might have even taken it up to 45. I'm not sure. Um, so I got in before I was 40. Um, unfortunately, less than 10% are females. Um, so, you know, I'm really keen on bridging the gap. And that's my latest project is my legacy project, which is called Basal. And I'd love to share that with you because that's really my passion project for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, um, you know, the, it, it's a network where we all get to share connections. And, you know, the old saying, you know, money makes money. Mm -hmm. um, I believe connections make money because, you know, uh, it's the quality of your network uh, and the people that you're hanging around that really accelerate your growth. So I love being part of that organization. I'm actually a YPO Hollywood member. Mm -hmm. And I've just, um, which is such an honor, I've just been accepted to be one of the founding members of a brand new chapter called YPO Impacts, Global mm -hmm. Impacts, which is pretty cool. So um, within YPO, um, there is a lot of opportunities um, for collaboration, uh, especially around new tech developments. I'm very interested in uh, disrupting the MLM and direct selling model mm -hmm. um, and also the internet of internets as far as, you know, Facebook and Google and how people acquire their customers. So that's my latest little uh, challenge that I'm quite mm -hmm. enjoying. Um, and, you know, they, those sorts of things come through the YPO connection. The other thing is deals. So um, a lot of these big businesses, one of my business partners has a great business. He's got like 3,000 staff. He's, you know, floated his company, but he's got the side business with his family that just happened to be on Shark Tank and just happened to sell 500,000 units. But anyone else would call that an amazing business. But for him, it's a really small business compared to what he's running. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when he heard about me taking sweat equity, he's a very smart man. He's like, you know, we've thrown money at it. It's not about that. We need somebody focusing on it and driving it mm -hmm. and having good strategies. So, you know, I obviously um, was offered 50% in that company. Now that mm -hmm. company was valued at a lot more money than mm -hmm. the ones that I used to invest in. So the deals are a little bit bigger um, and a little bit more sophisticated. Um, but I do love that because, um, uh, you know, they're just further along the track for me, um, which makes it more worth my, my time, if that makes sense. So, mm -hmm. yeah, everything's relative, right? Yeah. So tell me more about the deals that you do. Like how many um, businesses have you actually um, acquired equity in and how many like took off and how many do you just return the equity? Yeah. So there's been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven or eight I've done so far, mm -hmm. if I go through all of them. Um, one uh, was a really quick exit, which was fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. A great growth story. Another one um, was, was great in Australia, didn't work in America. Mm -hmm. So that one, um, you know, I walked away from. Another one was, um, is still going. Um, mm -hmm. And that one's uh, doing really well in America. Um, and I actually ended up buying out my business partner in that one. So I own that one a hundred percent. Um, and then the ones through YPO, um, uh, are fairly new. They're like in the mm -hmm. last 12 months. So everything has a five to seven year sort of timeline. Mm -hmm. And then the latest one is actually, uh, more of, um, so there's uh, the Basal Academy and the Basal Marketplace. So they're the ones that I'm focusing on predominantly. And then, of course, I have my agency. I'm still running the agency as well. And then I still have the Venture Capital Fund as well. So yeah. a few things going on. But, um, you know, I, I, there's a great saying called pick Picassos. So mm -hmm. um, my end goal, though, is to um, create um, an advisory board and invest in multiple brands that I put that I've put through my channel so eventually I'd like to invest in you know uh, I'd like to have at least 30 at one time but you know we'll get to that 30, 30 companies that you own equity in at one time mm. okay that's cool and how many do you own like right now at actively managing eight eight as in eight right now I thought some were exited already yeah, no, but I've acquired a couple of others as well, I've built okay. other ones that are just mine as well. So I I, I've got eight active companies at the moment, which also includes the um, uh, marketing agency, which has been going for like 20 years. So I it's still a company I, I own. <laughs> I see, I see. Cool, yeah. cool. And uh, okay, tell me more about the exits. Like, do you receive everything in cash or you receive in, uh, or like what, how, how do you exit? 
was it a leverage buyout was it uh yeah how, how do you exit well uh, i don't think i've done a, a proper exit <laughs> Okay. Uh, each ones have had these things that you know i like to say don't be a lazy genie on exit mm -hmm. so um for me you know i don't do earnouts anymore you um, don't do earnouts okay earn yeah because yeah, it's just too time consuming and i'm not sure. really great at being an employee mm -hmm. um so that's one of my rules that i've um i've learned i'd rather leave uh take less money and not do the earn out mm -hmm. um the second thing that i lessons learned from exits would be um that i want to put it in hands of somebody who'll take it on to make it bigger than what it was so mm -hmm. i'm very clear about know your bus stop mm -hmm. i want to get businesses to a certain size and then i want to pass it on to somebody who i know can then plug in their things and take it to the next stage i get kind of a little bit disheartened and and um unengaged when i'm dealing with hundreds of staff and hr and board meetings and management meetings because i'm a creative right mm -hmm. so that doesn't serve me so whilst i could probably stay in that company and sometimes i do leave um shares in the company mm -hmm. um uh, but uh you know getting out before all of that happens is really important because uh to me that's that's not what i enjoy um mm -hmm. so yeah so just understanding that is really important so wherever you where whenever you want an exit make sure you talk start with the exit in mind mm -hmm. so what i'm doing now is i'm i'm going to the people that i want to exit to i'm having conversations and saying you're my ideal exit partner what do you want it to look like because some people don't want things like the factory and the equipment and all that stuff because they want to leverage the the factory that they have and they want to do a plug and play. A lot mm -hmm. of them are telling me that, you know, they're very retail focused. They'd love to acquire a business that's really focused on online. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like for them? Um, so I really, I, I actually, even though I love to grow businesses my way um, because I have my strengths, um, I also ask them what would be an inconvenience at the exit. Do you want to see IP separate to, you know, the company? Um, you know, how do you want it structured so that this is a really easy thing for you to, to acquire and then take it to the next level, knowing that our values are aligned. So that's mm -hmm. been the one disconnect is making sure I always chased exits based on the amount of money I got for the exit. Mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore. And now look at what are the values that I want in the company to acquire the, the business it's not about the money exit if i can mm. get that that's fantastic but mm. really you want your baby to go on and be big, bigger and better and you know yeah. sometimes you sell businesses and somebody else destroys it you hear that so many times yeah it's really sad when you put in all that effort you know yeah i like that we are having this conversation because this has always been something i wanted to do like um, invest in startups uh, invest in businesses and then um, buy build and sell buy build and sell yeah um okay yeah and uh and there's a great opportunity for that like i just you know can i can i give you some yeah, mentoring sure. i love mentoring yeah, sure. <laughs> you know i can't help myself i love mentoring um so you know one of the things oh, my battery's getting low i'll just take you inside sure. one of the things that um i quite often say to um people that i'm mentoring is um you know um when you're looking at investments um, and building and selling and building and selling, which is kind of, is that what you're thinking of doing? Correct. Buy, build and sell. And sometimes I retain a bit of equity if I feel that there's potential. You know? So you're already doing it, are you? I have a social, I have a tuition business and a social media marketing agency. Yeah. Okay. I, I own like 20% of those businesses. Yeah. Okay, great. And do you have business partners inside of those? Yeah, they are, it's actively managed by them. They own like, 60 to 80 percent and i only own like 20 percent and i and i'm already getting dividends from those so to me i, I would say those are cow businesses yeah got you got you yeah. all right so what i wanted to um uh present to you as as you know what i've because i'm mentoring um 22 women at the moment that are eoers and ypoers right mm -hmm. um and it's just something that i love to do to give back because i'm trying to bridge that gap for females mm -hmm. to get to that 20 mil mark um and you know there's a huge opportunity at the moment with the baby boomers Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of businesses that haven't been able to remain relevant when it comes to social media. For mm -hmm. us, it's our second nature. Um, but for those people, it's not. They're all looking to retire. And that's actually escalated over the last couple of years because um, of COVID and the struggles that they're having in business. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you get to a certain age, you just, you just don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. Uh, now, 
everything supply and demand. So if you were being really proactive, mm -hmm. you, you could um, create a mandate. And this is something mm -hmm. I always say, I've, I've spent a little bit of time with the Shark Tank people, mm -hmm. um, you know, just doing some tours with them to remote areas and stuff, you know, so that we can hear people pitch and help them with pitching. And one thing that I hear from a lot of them is they feel very stretched because they're investing in a tech company and then a food company and then a fashion company, and they're all completely different. So, mm -hmm. or real estate or uh, so many different types of industries. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can, with me, I'm very clear, beauty and wellness, that's vegan, cruelty-free, female founded, gives back, clean, zero committed to zero waste. If it, if, if, if it doesn't even tick one of those boxes, it's a no from me. And it really makes it easy because entre entrepreneurs like shiny objects. Mm, yeah. So we need to be able to create a list and a mandate to easily say no to things. But, mm -hmm. you know, what I'll say to them is, look, but I appreciate that. And if you want to share with me what your mandate is, we kind of have this investment circle where we go, okay, we go and talk to this person. Mm -hmm. So to be very clear on what it is that you want so that you don't have to be an expert in different industries. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing is, is look at the timing. So if mm -hmm. you know what your mandate is and the timing right now is there's heaps of businesses, heaps of baby boomers who want to exit their business that are traditional. Mm -hmm. So because of supply and demand, because there's so many of them, you're going to get them a lot cheaper or they're not going to even get an exit. So you could literally go in or partner with somebody and say, we'll buy the business off you. They want out, like just take the whole thing. But do your due diligence on, imagine if I was to use my social media skills, what could this business do? Because it's mm -hmm. a traditional business. Mm -hmm. So look for those opportunities, know what your mandate is, go out and what's called reverse pitching. And I learned this from my mentor, Jeff Hoffman, who built Priceline.com. You know, the best businesses are not for sale. Mm -hmm. um, and you shouldn't go around and pitch to get money. He said, you know, women only get 2% of capital anyway. Why would you bother? Mm -hmm. And then there's a sniff factor. If you pitch it too many times and too many people have said no, people go, well, what's wrong with the business? And then nobody wants mm -hmm. to invest in it, right? So he says reverse pitch. And uh, he gave this great example where um, he had built the, you know, the kiosks where you check in. This mm -hmm. is like 30 years ago. You check in at the airport so you don't have to go up and see a customer service person. Mm -hmm. um, so... What he did was he had invented that and he wanted capital, but he was young and he was a, um, he was a software engineer, I think was his, his trade at the time. And so what he did was he looked for the airline with the worst customer service, the worst number of customer complaints, the worst staff morale from their horrible jobs mm -hmm. um, because everyone was complaining and the one who had the most planes missed. Mm -hmm. Right. And due to people lining up and not getting checked in in time. So what he did was he instead of spending six months running around and pitching to everybody, trying to get some seed capital, he went and he, he learned everything about this one airline that was mm -hmm. the worst. And then he went to them and he said, if I was able to increase your staff morale and happiness in their jobs by 20%, if I was able to um, reduce the amount of people that miss their planes by 40%, mm -hmm. and if I was able to um, uh, increase your um, customer star rating and review rating um, from uh, two stars to four stars, mm -hmm. would you give me, I don't remember the sum, $10 million? Now, to a CEO who runs that airline, that's compelling. Mm -hmm. So... I tell you that example because I love experience shares because, and he got his check, um, mm -hmm. is because if you can find businesses that are traditional, that want to retire, but aren't able to get the capital that they want because there's a saturation of people trying to sell their baby boomer businesses, mm -hmm. you could go to them and say, okay, um, what if I was to get you the exit money that you actually want? Mm -hmm. Um get you out of the business sooner rather than later. And I'm going to apply my strategies of online so I can diversify this business to grow it so that you can get your exit. And what does that look like for you? You know, find their pain points. Their pain points is that they want, want to get the money that they thought they would have got pre-COVID. They want, um, you know, to see that their business goes on and, and lives on because it's been their life's work. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they, 
they want to know that there's a bit of a guarantee if it doesn't work, you know? So it's just an example of how you could go out there and find businesses that fit your mandate um, and seek out some pretty cool opportunities. Um, mm -hmm. so anyway, that's just a little bit of mentoring that I don't know if that cool. helped. Yeah, that's helped. So what kind of P ratio do you normally exit at? And what kind of P ratio do you normally like acquire businesses at? Or like, how do you come up, come to an agreement? Yeah. So what kind of shows did you say? Okay, PE ratios, like the price to earning ratios. Oh, okay. Well, my due diligence um, okay. So what kind of uh, price to earning multiples do you normally exit your companies at? Okay. So that, that is a very broad question because it's mm -hmm. actually about the industry type. Mm -hmm. um, and also where you're at. So uh, for me, you know, exiting companies in Australia isn't as lucrative as if I was exiting a company in America. Mm -hmm. Again, buyers, you know, US dollar, all that sort of stuff. So there are some industry average, averages that I like to stick to. Mm -hmm. And what I tend to do is um, set my business up to have the highest multiple. Mm -hmm. So there's certain things that, again, if you start with the end in mind and find out what they're after, what will push that multiple up. Mm -hmm. uh you know things that are really important that they don't like is things like churn mm -hmm. so how churn is how quickly you go through your customers so you repeat um so knowing all your data is really important and that helps drive it up there are industry averages eight is usually an average uh seven to eight is what i try to achieve mm -hmm. um but uh you know for me um uh you know the quality of the customers the reoccurring of that uh showing them what the upside is is really important too. If you can show them potential earnings, if you were to plug it into their business, you can get a higher multiple as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's always really important. So, so my job really is to work on the metrics that get the highest multiple and then work with someone who wants to buy it and show them the pet potential upside on their mm -hmm. side if they were to plug their business into it um, so that I can get a few points at their end, if that makes sense. But yeah. You know what? It's only ever worth what someone's willing to write a check for, and Correct. as you know, that's not my value anymore. I've sold companies for money, and it hasn't been fulfilling. So, mm -hmm. um, for me now, a multiple is great. It's a bit like a game, and business is just a game. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, um, and I obviously have investors and business partners that I want to see do really well out of it. But at the end of the day, I think you know, the exit multiple. I don't do unicorns. I'm not a tech mm -hmm. person. I don't think I'm ever going to get a 15 times exit. <laughs> who 15? knows? Okay. 15, who knows? Um, but you know what? I've got on my bucket list that I want to IPO one day. So that's where, mm -hmm. you know, you get some other multiples that are even bigger again. So, Same. you know, for now, I'm, I'm just happy building and selling and getting, it's definitely by far the best return on investment. And I started doing property developing when I was quite young. I bought a mm -hmm. property units when I was 24 in the city. Mm -hmm. And still to this day, the best return on investment is investing in businesses. Um, so, you know, to me, I'm not greedy. Mm -hmm. I'm very clear how much I want to get. What is my return on investment? Everybody wins. Hopefully mm -hmm. they get some upside. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a long-ended question, but um, sure. that's kind of like... Depends on what you're buying too, right? Sure. And anything. Um, so, um, okay. So tell me where I went wrong, okay? So um, th the other day I was talking to this entrepreneur and he was saying that I did everything completely wrong, right? Because right now I'm raising funds at a 20 times uh, P PE multiple, right? And um, the closing rate has been super high. Like out of three investors, I speak to three investors invested. And um, I, okay, so, so here's the thing. Would you agree that um, equity is worth, very differently depending on who owns equity like so repeat that again equity is equity is worth very differently it, like 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 one percent is not one percent like elon Musk owning one percent versus a random entrepreneur owning one percent of you know it's it's all yeah it's just like how money is relative like money is only worth um money is only worth a lot when it, depending on who uses the money and how, how what that money is used for yeah, who's willing to pay for it right so, you know? um, and I think people are investing in people nowadays. Correct. Um, and you know, um, I, I also, I also see this thing called founder syndrome, and it's a horrible mm -hmm. saying, but mm -hmm. it's kind of what the people at the big end of town sort of talk about. Mm -hmm. And founder syndrome is where people think that you know they've got the best business, and you know it's worth a gazillion dollars. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a bit of a reality check in that um, that McDonald's don't have the best burgers. Yeah. Um, you know, and whilst it's a great business and it's a great product, if it's not a well-known product and mm -hmm. it doesn't have a great strategy and good foundations and 
the right IP and all that sort of stuff, then it's mm -hmm. actually not worth it. So it's really important that people, again, it comes down to greed and expectation and ignorance. If you mm -hmm. really want to understand what your business is worth, go out and do that due diligence for yourself and figure that out. Um, you know, a lot of venture capitalists inside the beauty industry now have these really sophisticated software that they're running over um, mm -hmm. these, um, these businesses' sales and they can see everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah. it really does the due diligence for them. So, you know what? Um, I'd rather, like, Jeff, how much does he own? He owns 10%, doesn't he, of Amazon? Of Amazon, yeah. Still, yeah, and he's still the richest man in the world. So I think um, I think it's important for us to think about collaboration. Don't give up too much equity at the start. Um, and, uh, you know, really think about also um, what you want this business to go on to do. Like, mm -hmm. for me, it's all about business for good. Um, and there's a real rise in um, social impact investing mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And it's really refreshing to see lots of venture capitalists. Actually, I've got a meeting tonight mm -hmm. at midnight um, with um, a heap of investors that are social impact investors. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really refreshing for me to see that they're looking at sustainable things. And, and not only refreshing, it's actually highly commercial. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be interviewing um, in a couple of weeks a gentleman who um, uh, lectures and does um, master's degrees or MBAs in impact investing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of statistics and data that suggests that businesses that are socially responsible and stand for profit and purpose are going to be the next creation of wealth makers. Mm -hmm. So that's really exciting for me because yeah. that's the stuff I invest in. I'm doing it because I care and that's what I believe businesses should be doing is we need to be taking the charge to fix the world's problems, not governments. Correct. Um, but it's just, it was kind of cool to also find out that that's actually what he predicts is going to be where all the, the, the big exits mm -hmm. are going to be. So you never know. I might go from my 8 to 15. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> just through that alone. Cool. Yeah, and, and I feel like, you know, when you exit a company, like normally the standard P, the price to earnings multiple will be about two two times to three times to four times um, yeah. because you're exiting Even the business. Service. And yeah. yeah, you know, if it's a service or for most for most businesses, traditional businesses in general. Um, but whereas when an entrepreneur is continue, like, like is continuing to run the business, I feel that, that I feel that it could be raised at a much higher multiple. So okay, maybe you just let me know where I went wrong, right? Or maybe mm -hmm. if it's correct, just let me know. So, There's no the, such thing as wrong, by the way. Correct, correct. But there was this... Uh, wrong if you make the same uh, the lessons. You have to learn the same lessons over and over again. Sure. Everything is just... There's no mistakes. There's only lessons. Sure. So I was talking to this guy and he thinks that I completely overvalued my company. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay. So this is something I, te I wanted to test. Uh, so I tested very, very small on a small business so that... Because to me, I just want to learn because I know that if I can do... If it works well for a small business... Mm -hmm. and, you know, if it fails, let it fail for a small business. At least, you know, it doesn't, um, it's not it's not that big of a failure. And then um, if it works, and then I, I can apply the same same uh, metrics or the same um, systems for a bigger business. But okay, so basically I have this uh, tuition business that she she's a, so pro like she's a freelancer, right? So um, in Singapore, tuition is a huge thing. Uh, uh, tuition is where uh, parents will send their kids to tuition, uh, like extra classes so that they get better grades, okay? Now, so she's making about 2.5k per month in net profit, which is about 30k per year. So the moment I, I, I so I asked her to give me equity for free, like equity in exchange for like sweat equity. So in exchange, I give her advisory and all that kind of stuff. And um, so, she, so, so we raised capital, okay? Mm -hmm. And I raised capital at a $600,000 valuation, okay? Now, how did I raise capital at a $600,000 valuation? I pitched to yes, investors this way, okay? So I said, Okay, so she's making 30K per year, right? In net profit, okay. So if let's say you own 1% of the business, that means if she makes 30K per year, you make $3,000 per year, okay? Mm -hmm. So I asked them, uh, you, you make $300 per year. Yeah. 30K, yeah, so you should make $300 per year. So I asked them to invest 6K to own 1% of the business, okay? Mm -hmm. So um, with 6K, they own 1% of the business. Um, if, she, if she continues at the current rate she is at, they'll get $300 per, uh, per year in dividends. That's about 5%. Um, in dividends and that's just counting dividends not counting capital capital appreciation and if you ask me 5% dividends per year that's reasonable in fact that's slightly above the market rate yeah yeah and I, I get it them, but, it, but it is key person dependent correct correct okay but I told them this I said but that's only based on her making 30k per year now but if she makes um 60k per year okay which with my because 
in Price my own business, I make exactly. yeah. I'm coaching her. I'm making about 50k to 100k a month in my in revenue in my own business. So if I can help her get to let's say 5k per month or 10k per month, okay. So if she's starting to make 60k per year or 120k per year. Now, if they hold on to their shares, they will get like maybe $600 a year in dividends or maybe $1,200 per year in dividends. And if they sell their shares, they can sell their shares for way more than $6,000. They can sell their shares for maybe $12,000 because the next person wouldn't mind paying $12,000 to have $1,200 a year in dividends. Mm. So when I pitched this to the investors, uh, we did three meetings, all three investors. Um, it was a well, 100%. It's, it's low barriers to entry, right? It's not like a massive capital. Correct, correct. So, so it was a like it was 100% closing rate. Um, and I don't think that I overvalued my company. Um, but what But what are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be an investment for me because I can't see the big strategy. So mm -hmm. I've seen similar models to this done before. And actually, one of the investments that we have in our venture capital fund is a, um, a uh, staffing uh, business in, in Manila. Mm -hmm. that has thousands of staff, right? Wow. That, um, you know, because Australians love to offshore things. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, to me, um, key person risk is one thing. Um, but um, I also um, look at the model and think of it, or to give you some feedback. So I look at cottage-based businesses and cottage-based mm -hmm. things. So for instance, one of the investments that we did in the venture capital fund um, we invested in businesses that provide services to the real estate sector. So uh, for every $3 that someone pays for rent, a dollar goes back through that real estate agent to maintain that property. They don't own any of that those businesses. So we help them invest in buying those businesses so they can make more than money, more money than just managing the properties, right? Mm -hmm. So I really like the idea of cottage. So there's a lot of, um, you know, people who might do the signs, the full rent signs or the full sale signs, right? Mm -hmm. But they're all different businesses all over the place. So think of these like your freelancers, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so they're all over the place in all these little businesses and they're called cottage businesses. If you're able to put those together um, and, you know, have a hundred freelancers, uh, but they all have one person or a team of people doing their accounting, mm -hmm. a team of people doing their admin. They all f have systems and processes that make them more productive mm -hmm. so that they can then make more money and yeah. take all the stuff off them. Because if they're freelancers, they're creatives, right? They're not interested right. in the admin shit. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, what we do is we might buy three or four electrician companies mm -hmm. that are all in the major areas, like the top ones in those areas and then put all that stuff underneath to help them so that they've, they've got economies of scale. Does that make sense? And yeah. then they so, might all be under one brand. Correct. So that's that's another thing you could look at. Is that you kind of, because what is your end goal with this? Because it sounds very transactional as opposed to, you know, something that you're rolling up for an exit. So she, so I, I think exactly the same way as you. So I have um, advised her to um, have like franchisees and everything. So, um, so they are using her method of teaching. She has a method that gets a straight A's for students. Like almost all her students get A's and A stars. So uh, she, she teaches people how to start a tuition business for $5,000. So people pay her $5,000 and she would teach them her method. And um, she can even give them clients and everything and get a percentage of, of that. Yeah, so um, that's why we are scaling the business in terms of like we are recruiting more teachers right now. Um, mm -hmm. so eventually the key person risk, I mean, it, there will always be a key person risk in any business, even like Amazon has a key person risk. If Jeff Bezos suddenly yeah. dies or if uh, Mark Zuckerberg suddenly sure dies. sure backed up by some pretty serious systems and processes though. Sure, sure. But mm -hmm. it won't, it won't, it won't perform in a way, like if Elon Musk dies, I don't think SpaceX will perform anywhere close to, because, mm -hmm. because those, like, I always believe that the leader is one of the most important in any business because even if the business model is wrong or something with the right leader, he can pivot, he can adjust. And I think the, the leader is the yeah, most it's, important. It's all on a pivoting scale. So don't forget there's innovation and growing of the company and then yeah. there's systems and processes, right? So as the okay. systems and processes come into play yeah. and, you know, they, they can still do their visionary, but they tend to go into verticals, which is, Correct. you know, where, where you can hold multiples. I think it's really important What's high risk about what you're doing is um, there's a couple of things. You said franchise. Mm -hmm. Don't do that unless you know what you're doing. And that's a whole lot of compliance. I'm not a huge franchising fan, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, and licensing is fairly similar. I'm not sure what it's like in your country, but it's it's a lot of admin. It's kind of like mm -hmm. IPOing or, yeah. or floating. Um, 
you've really got to make sure your timing's right. So for me, my advice would be as quickly as you get systems and processes in place where you can bring on people mm-hmm. um, so that you have a, a range of freelancers that goes from a cottage-based industry to something bigger, and then that will start to happen. The risk of yeah. key person will go down, the systems will go up, the profits will go up Correct. because, you know, you're supporting them. That should be your first goal and looking at how do I get to my first 100 freelancers mm-hmm. and then, ha- you know, Free, um, franchising shouldn't even be on the radar until you're right. at a first. So I, what I'm what I'm hearing is a lack of, and you may have it, but a lack of strategy as to what is the end goal and what are we working back from, um, and then you know a reinvestment strategy for them as well. Mm-hmm. Like you know, if it was a low investment for them, the return isn't that important to them either. Yeah. So having a reinvestment strategy so they can actually put those dividends straight back into shares would be really cool to help you scale. So, because there's only one of you to train them, so you're going to have a glass ceiling. Yeah. And there's key men risk in them. Does it make sense? Correct. But you know what? Um, you're a salesperson, so <laughs> hats off to you for raising the capital. Um, but do you feel that I'm overvaluing or scamming the investors, or because I don't want um, to do that? You know. Yeah. Look, you've got to. They've got to be sophisticated investors, right? You wouldn't take mm-hmm. their last dollar, and it's got to be something that they wouldn't miss. Yeah. Um, I'm very much about ethical investing, um, for sure. Um, but just remember under promise over deliver. Mm-hmm. And if you want to be an investor, guard your reputation. Yeah. So you, you've got to, you've got to know this will work. And if it won't, you'd almost be willing to write a check to save your face. Cause at the start, mm-hmm. you don't want to be doing big deals Correct. Uh, that you can't deliver on. That would Correct. be my feedback. Which is why I chose to like see if this works on a small scale, and if it works, then I can I, I can I can do that for bigger businesses, which I do have a, a lot of access to. Because um, don't forget, it's also about the investment story. Yeah. So you know, in our VC fund, we 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 had much bigger numbers that we wanted to achieve, mm-hmm. but we downplayed them a lot, mm-hmm. and we told them that their return was a lot smaller than what we were aiming for. Mm-hmm. So then when we went back and we've, we've, you know, had an amazing success, amazing growth, what's really cool is now the shareholders are thrilled. And when those, the guys, it wasn't my fund, the second one that they went and did, but when they went out and asked for money again, mm-hmm. they didn't have to shop it. They just went back to the existing investors. So also just think very strategically, think about reputation, um, you know, um, you really want the same investors to be constantly reinvesting in you. Because people mm-hmm. follow founders and and I think they invest in people. So yeah, yeah. So, does that so, help? Yeah, it definitely helps. Like at least I got more clarity. Like I was thinking that maybe I'm doing something really wrong because everyone is telling me you know two x to three x multiple, and I'm thinking like, am I really overvaluing? Because when I when I pitch this to them, I didn't even like I I can say that okay these are our plans, but I didn't mm. promise them uh, anything more than like what what we are and i told them even if she continues They're big people i'm sure they signed an agreement right yeah they signed an agreement and and some of them are like yeah. financial services directors so they, they kind of know the investment market so it's not that they are stupid people or anything yeah and some of them do yeah. in angel investing yeah yeah exactly it's probably for them they see it as an angel investment but still yeah. it's a great opportunity don't forget value people's time and the money they give you the most yeah that's critical you know you're young um singapore's you know very much reputation based everywhere shit is reputation based right it's the world um it's different for me too you know you're young i'm a female gotta do a little bit more work yeah. all right so where can people follow you if they want to find you yeah great well um so i'm obviously on clubhouse mm-hmm. uh i'm mentoring um aspiring entrepreneurs um you know, to help bridge the gaps, they can find me there. I'm also on the Instagram. Um, I do look at my own DMs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They get sorted for me, but I do respond. Um, I do run a mentoring program. I only take 25 people at a time, but again, I pick brands Mm -hmm. and that's another great way to help and give back. If I'm not taking equity in them, I can at least help them and give them the process of how I scale my businesses. And I give that IP away. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's lots of ways. It just depends on what they're after, Um, you know, but please check out my latest project. I'm really excited about it. It's um, called Basal. It's an ancient Gaelic word, which means ethical. And we've created a marketplace where we only sell ethical beauty and wellness products. So, you know, how I said keeping it simple is really important. I've spent Mm -hmm. a couple of years working on this with my mentor 
Um, and he said, what's one thing that you could do that would make a massive positive impact to the world? And it needs to be simple. And I thought it was just raising capital and investing in businesses, but that was going to take 10 to 20 years to get to the amount of money under, you know, under investment for me to make an impact. So he said, it'll be really simple. And, and it dawned on me after lots of strategy work and lots of mentoring sessions. I just want to take back 1% of the beauty and wellness sector. Mm-hmm. That's it. One, the, the industry is worth $150 billion. Mm-hmm. So that's a billion dollars I'd like to take back. So I'm going to have 1%. Mm-hmm. And I'd mm-hmm. like to take it back by asking women not to spend more money, consumers, but for conscious consumers to switch from unethical brands to ethical brands. And when I say ethical, what I mean is uh, that they're female founded, they're mm-hmm. cruelty free, they're vegan, they're made locally um, and they give back. So we have giving embedded in every product that we sell. So by that simple task of saying to women, female consumers who are conscious, switch from your existing brand to one that's exactly the same price and affordability, but has high efficacy and supports another female founder because we don't own our own industry. Mm -hmm. We don't own it, yet we support it 100%. So let's, you know, women really want to help other female founders. Women really want to support brands that give back. So that's all I'm doing. And that will create 10, that will grow 10,000 female brands. Yeah. That's 10,000 brands that'll get to grow from that. Yeah. And it's 10 million impacts to the UN a year. Yeah. I love your mission. And I always believe like mission is the most important when it comes to getting employees to buy in, getting customers to buy in, getting investors to buy in. And I can completely see like the path that you definitely skill. Um, to very, start with that yeah. for yourself too. Like that, you know, I literally, whilst I was doing equity projects, that has been my focus for two years. Everyone's mm-hmm. like, we don't understand. Why aren't you doing more equity projects? Why aren't you doing all this stuff? I said, I'm about to spend 10 years on a mission. And this is my mission of why I was put on this planet. I'm not rushing into it. I'm going to make sure it's very clear. And when I say it to you, does that come across as a very clear, not a huge yes. thing? Does it sound complicated? No. <laughs> no. It's and it's actually completely doable, right? Yeah. You know, so spend that time on that strategy and i would encourage you to do the same go away spend your time on the strategy what is it that you're trying to do you know if it's to support freelancers give them a community to come together and give them options to be able to exit you know um and have maternity leave and all these things like think about how you can create a community and support female females so that they can and freelancers so they can live the life that they want and they don't have to go to an office from nine to five and serve their families and their communities like really think about how you're serving those freelancers and that'll attract the right investments investors really work on your why yeah um because you know it could be very similar to what i've just said yeah I agree. you know what i'm saying yeah how do you spell your website again so that i'll put it in the description but how do you spell it Basal, it's b-e-u S-A-I-L. So as in B U and Sale. <laughs> yeah. So all of you watching this interview, make sure you visit that and uh I'll put the link in the description. All right. Thank you so Thank much, you. Tamara, for your time today. You it, it was amazing. I think I've like, yeah, I've learned so much from you and gotten so much clarity. Um I wish you You're all the best in your great. business. Yeah. You're a go-getter. Stay in touch. I'd love to hear how you're going. Um, awesome. Really exciting. And uh, I'll give you that sweat equity handbook as well, because there might be people in your sure. digital marketing community who are looking to invest in as well. I know you've had Mike Moria on, but I'd be happy to share with you the resources. Sure. Um, and uh, that might help them in, in uh, seeing whether that's an option for themselves. Yeah, maybe you can share the link. Like maybe you can share the link or something and I'll put it in the description. That sounds great. That's okay, great. Sounds good. Thank you so Thank much for your time. Pleasure. Stay in touch <laughs> and, and good luck and be a business for good. All right. Take care. See you. Take care. Bye-bye.